Ah, ah. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jin Soo, and I'm in charge of running the next um, part of the show, I guess. Uh, so I'll be here in charge of running. Uh, I'm a session chair of research on sustainability and entrepreneurship. And here we have, um, uh, as a speaker, we have Sean Hiat from the University of so so Southern California. Uh, he's an associate professor at USC Marshall School of Business and a faculty affiliate of the Grief Center for Entrepreneur uh, Studies. Prior to joining USC, he was um, a faculty member at HBS, and he's a, a global energy and agribusiness expert. Um, we'd love to um, uh, get some great insight from him, and um, so that's the the speaker we have today. And for the, uh, the discussant, we have Professor Young Chun Kim from UNIS. Uh, he's an associate professor at Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology. And um, we, we, I think in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of wrap it up there and then uh, start our session. So uh, Professor Sean. Okay, hello everyone. So um, I'm going to talk about specifically this aspect of like how entrepreneurs can tackle what's been known as the energy transition. Um, so uh, before I get into these entrepreneurial opportunities, right, if, I'm going to identify some of the challenges um, because this is where the opportunities for entrepreneurs to create potential value lie, right? And there are many challenges in this 21st century energy system. So let's just talk about the first one, which is the continual growth of population as well as economic growth. And as we see this, it, the population you know, growth is starting to plateau, though it is still going to grow through the end of the century. But where the biggest issue comes in terms of greater demand for energy is in the um, econ economic growth. So if we look here we are going to have a growth, a larger growth, and from lower to middle to higher income individuals, right? Which is an excellent aspect, right? That we're bringing more people out of poverty and into areas where they can enjoy a much better standard of life. With that also comes, though, greater energy use because obviously, you know, they're going to want a phone. Why not, right? Smartphones, electronics, um, moving from a bicycle to motorcycles, powered vehicles to automobiles, right? All of these require greater energy. So this is one of the biggest challenges right now. Energy demand will continue to grow, all right? Then if we think about, right, the history of energy transitions, in fact, I got to tell you, there has really only been one transition that's ever happened, and that was really from moving from cow dung and wood to coal, Okay, all right, but that took well over a hundred years. This is a great chart here that shows generally um, well how energy adoption is different new um, technologies, how long it takes after 50 years. So after 50 years, you could see here that coal ended up making about 35% of energy in its first 50 years. Oil, petroleum to 25, natural gas to 20%, nuclear. Well, it actually went down. It peaked halfway through at 5%, and then its use has gone continually down. Never made it out, uh, you know. And then if we look at renewables, this is the intermittent wind and solar, right? We're just about 10, 12 years out, and it's producing about 3%. So you see that trajectory. That's what it's looking like. So just to kind of give you an example of that, right? What we've seen in the past and so far has mainly been energy additions and not so much energy, excuse me, um, here we go, uh, sub transitions. So if we look at the current trajectory just in the last five years of where we're going, right, and this is based on the International Energy Agency as well as other government agencies on energy, um, we will see additional growth renewables, about three, per, uh, three times that amount growth in the other types of energy uses. But notice, they're still going to grow. We're going to have a cumulative um, average return growth of like one per annual return growth of 1%, at least for the, the coal 
almost 1% for petroleum products, um, excuse me, 0.4% for coal, sorry about the colors there, uh, nuclear, only about a half, but yeah, and then over three times that for renewables. So this is 2050, what they're predicting, right? And again, that's also the same year that they're saying, well, we're going to be net zero for carbon emissions, not at the current trajectory that we currently have in the world, okay? Now, what does that require? Okay, so that, that was essentially what it looks like as of 2023. Now, if we look at what would require basically from 2021, this is what would have have to happen. This is kind of based on some older data. But in order to make what they claimed this net zero uh, emissions by 2050, you would have to have exponential rate growth in both the wind power, the solar, the battery electric cars, Hydrogen, 200 times, right, we got to have. And carbon capture, this is his last one, at least 100 times what we're having now, right? That's, this is the reality here, right? So, um, and a challenge. We, it'll require um, large amounts. And, and by the way, just to scale this, I'm going to get to the next one. This requires large quantities of mineral resources. But if you look back in time, no extractive industry, whether that be coal, or oil or iron has ever been able to double their supply in a decade. So that kind of gets us to this next one, which are the minerals required, right? Because if we go to this lower carbon, lower emissions economy, well, we're gonna need a lot more minerals. Take a look at this comparison on the top. We have the traditional conventional car, the internal combustion automobile. That's how much kilograms per vehicle is mined out of the ground to make that internal combustion engine car. In comparison, an electric car, right, is up to 200 or some kilograms per vehicle, right? Why is it so much? Well, because you have to extract a lot of this ore and then refine it and process it down to the little bits you need for like the batteries, right? That's massive amounts of mining we're going to need for every one of those vehicles. Now, also compare that with our renewable energy here. So we have, this is how much my, uh, you know, minerals are needed for like, say, natural gas, coal. As you can see, as we move to like solar, wind, and offshore wind, the amount of minerals that we need from the ground continues to grow. Okay, so large demand needed now for these minerals that are listed here on the board. Um, and just um, to see, this is the estimates, right? Currently, what we have, um, Estimates of like copper, graphite, nickel, silicon, zinc, manganese. These are like the key minerals for this energy transition. Um, I mean, graphite's got to go up 17 times. The copper probably could be done by two times. We, we know we have enough copper here, but 17 times for graphite, 11 times for nickel, possibly. Lithium, 18 times the amount that we're producing today. That's going to be difficult. Now, in addition to like scaling up that amount of mining. Take a, there's a geopolitical issue here, right? Which is where a lot of this, these resources are found and where they're actually processed. So you can see the red here represents like China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Iran, North Korea. Uh, we've got the blue here, which is US, Western Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, and South Korea. It's like listed in this group. And of course, you have all the other countries. So we're not too worried so much about the nickel copper. That's spread out across all countries around the world. You're not going to see like a large potential security risk here of obtaining these minerals. But if you look at some of these things like titanium, silicon, those are mainly processed, by the way, in China. Right? They've got their, the rare earths also. Right? With nickel, um, don't have to worry so much about that. Um, and palladium, zinc kind of split there between China and Russia. So just to give you an idea, these are things we need to think about, but also there are potential opportunities for entrepreneurs, and I'll be getting to that soon once I get through all these challenges. Um, this is just the processing regions. If we see here, not to worry about copper, but for the lithium and the nickel, this is quite worse. In fact, lithium right here. Uh, this is mainly China, by the way. Russia doesn't process any lithium. So we're seeing basically 62% of lithium is while it can be extracted from, say, Chile or Peru, it then gets exported to China, 62% of it, where it's then refined, right? And we know this can be a risk. They 
just not too long ago, they decided to not export for about a year of rare earths to Japan for some sort of trade dispute. Um, kind of forced them to rethink their EV aspect and how they were going to source there. But that is an issue, right? If they command, and any, if any one country ha commands like a key mineral processing or the mining of it, right? They have a lot of bargaining power and it puts you at an energy security risk if this is what your future looks like. Okay, so now let's talk about the entrepreneurial opportunities. Those are some of the major challenges I threw up there. Okay, now let's pivot now to some of the entrepreneurial opportunities in energy and sustainable energy growth here. One thing I want to put out before we begin is that any energy system is made up of four key components, right? There is the sustainability aspect, which gets a lot of attention, right? This is like, you know, the air, the water impact, sulfur, mercury, right? Now there's a large emphasis on carbon dioxide emissions. But then there's also the availability, which is like, well, if you want hydropower, you better have water coming down from, you know, different levels of elevation. If you want to do solar, well, you should be in a location where you have a lot of sun and not cloudy days like in Germany, where they have a, a lot of clouds, right? So the other one was reliability. So you want to have a, a, an energy system where if you want the lights on, you could turn them on and expect the power to come on. Or if you're still using, like, say, petroleum products, you want to be able to fill up your vehicle. Um, this is word that I'm going to use a lot, which is this, I, it's called dispatchability. And that's where the, when the demand happens, there is always a supply immediately that could provide that, to, to satisfy that demand. And the last one is affordability, which <laughs> no one's paying attention to this one, right? Hugely important because when energy costs go up, right, these trickle through every sector of the economy leading to massive inflation. And this is what we saw in Europe. Europe's suffering through this. The um, United States had a large bout of energy moving also through the transportation sector. And now we're living in the Amazon economy, right? And all that's translated into all the goods you get. So uh, this is very important. Now, most of the focus, like I said earlier, has been on the sustainability aspect. That's getting all the attention. But where I believe, right, that entrepreneurs can come in is focusing on this reliability and affordability, right? Hold the sustainability and maybe the control for the availability, right? That's going to happen in the future no matter what. But the opportunities are in this reliability and availability. All right, so let's move on now and talk about this aspect of reliability um, and availability. Reliability is like this idea of like, you know, energy security as well. So what about the mining and refining of minerals? What can we do, right? Well, you can invest in mines. That's true. Right, um, and where we're seeing like a lot of companies do that. Um, now, again, you've got to have the resources there, and there's been also work on like deep sea mining to see if we could find some stuff. Hasn't been too successful so far, but it was a great entrepreneurial endeavor, and and maybe they still might find something. Um, you could invest in refineries. Like you could put the nice thing about refineries is as long as you've got a supply chain, you could build them anywhere. Tesla's been doing a great job with this by becoming this integrated electric vehicle company. Um, now, one of the issues, though, is with all of these, there's tremendous amount of geopolitical risk. And I just want to put that up there. We're seeing now a basically kind of like a reverse that we saw in the 1970s with the oil companies. Now we're seeing that with the mining companies, where there's the threat of expropriation. So Indonesia, or even like re uh, um, a revocation of contracts, uh, 2020, Indonesia said they would no longer export raw nickel, and they produce a lot of nickel. So now they said, you've got to now process and refine them in there. If you were a mining company, right, now you realize, oh, I can't sell my goods anymore. I'm going to have to either vertically integrate or invite somebody to come in to help, you know, refine and process this before I can get it out of the country. Two months ago, the president of Chile, who's a socialist, said that Lithium belongs to the state, and he's pushing the Congress of Chile to expropriate all lithium miners in the country. If that were to happen, I mean, production's likely going to stall and go down, right? They're the, one, the largest lithium producer in the world, along with copper. So that's a big threat. Now, again, this kind of goes back. To, I guess I got to have some <laughs> 
academic implications as well, right? So what can companies do or entrepreneurs, right? And maybe following some of the work on Cinzi Dorabanto's work on the gold mines could be helpful. As we think about stakeholder engagement, I think moving forward in terms of these like critical minerals, the stakeholder engagement is going to be particularly important. And I think that these strategies will probably vary based on whether you're like a large incumbent or a new venture. Um, all right, here's, here's something else. But here, let's think out of the box, right? We don't have to, maybe we don't have to go to the mines. Maybe there's other complementarities out there. This is a um, new technology developed by this, this new venture. It's an entrepreneurial venture called th Controlled Thermal Resources near the Salton Sea in California. And what they're doing is they partnered with a geothermal company to basically clean the brine. So this is the hot water coming from the earth that you know, turns into steam or even just like a heat exchange to actually power the turbines of geothermal. Um, and they are actually taking out key min minerals from the brine. And then this water gets pumped back into the well, by the way. So it's like recirculates, right? This is a really cool technology. And if it works out, I mean, they, this might be an effective way of actually collecting rare earth metals that we need, but through a complementary energy source like geothermal. Now, you guys live near the Pacific Ring of Fire. There is a lot of geothermal energy around here. The Philippines have quite a few plants. So does Indonesia. Um, so in terms of entrepreneurial opportunity, right, there are many plants you could partner with and see if this is an opportunity. Um, and Exxon and Chevron have already said that they actually want to get into the game on this too. So uh, if they're saying that there's an opportunity, I think for other entrepreneurial companies, just like controlled thermal resources. Of course, the research question that we could think about is like a capabilities, like is it, is it scope versus capital? Which of these companies are going to be best at doing that? Um, incumbents or the startups? And we're, we'll see from that. Let's now turn to the wind and solar issue. Uh, so this is Texas. ERCOT is the agency that manages the grid, the power grid, the electric grid, to make sure that everyone has enough energy. Um, this just kind of shows the volatility of the power generated by the wind in Texas. On average, it's about 33% of all their power. But look at the massive changes over days, right? I mean, it went from 5% all the way up to 65% in a matter of 24 hours. Okay. So with this volatility, then comes the entrepreneurial opportunity here is, well, what do we do? As we build out more and more of this wind, we've got to somehow balance it out so that we can have energy when it's really low. And then what do we do when it gets really high, right? Okay, well, let's move into this. This is where we need to be thinking instead of a levelized cost of energy to what is now, many experts are saying, called the effective load carrying capacity. And what this does, this takes into account the variation, the intermittency of a lot of these renewables like solar and wind, um, as well as the, the degree which we, I'm going to talk about more, is like the storage of energy that we're going to have to complement this with. Remember, we only get four hours of battery. So that might work for solar. But if you have like, well, let me just show you in the next slide here. But this is just like you could see here, the demand of electricity. If this got very cold here, so they used a lot of electricity to heat in Texas, but at the same time, the wind went down. They barely had, in fact, they had, that was, I think, a time where they had some blackouts. So, again, you need to have some sort of amount of energy, and a four-hour battery is not going to do that if there's no wind blowing for two or three days, right? <laughs> That's like 48 hours, you know, 72 hours. So this is a, this is a problem that Germany's facing. Uh, they call it the, the Dunkelflaute, right, which means the dark lull when the wind just stops blowing. And what do they do? Well, right now they're relying on their coal plants to try to make up for it. But the problem with coal plants is not very responsive. They're not quickly responsive like a, like a methane gas peaker, right? So this is, again, what the research is out there to try to figure out what can we do. Another thing that's related to this, which we have to address with the wind and solar, is the affordability issue. So be there is, and I'll go to the next slide to tell you why, but the, this, is, this correlation is actually true across the board, not just in Europe. So the, what we find is that where there's greater use of wind and solar, the cost of electricity are higher. Now, California is also an excellent example of this. It has, gosh, 60% supposedly of capacity of the generation is coming from solar. 
and its energy costs are now more than twice the average of the United States. Why? This is why. It's because in order to maintain, again, we're going back to this ELCC instead of the levelized cost, we're looking um, at this new type of understanding energy. We, gen we basically have to overbuild by five times in order to produce that energy that you need all the time on demand. Okay, and that's also with storage, a six hour storage device, right? <laughs> okay, so when you take all this into account, right, it's, uh, it's expensive, it's intermittent, right? Um, what can we do with wind and solar? Well, this is where I think my research question, I think, comes in. Right, so entrepreneurs, right, they need to somehow solve this. If we're going to do a lot of, we got to have a lot of complementarities, right? And right now, gas peakers are not one of them. Uh, but from like an academic research point of view, you know, I just think that there's a celebrity hype effect here with the wind and solar, um, <laughs> because they get a lot of attention and a lot of money and subsidies are thrown at them. But they're not the what I would consider like an optimum technology if we want to maintain the lights on and have, have affordability and reliability. Not at this stage, unless we have some sort of complement, maybe a long storage, which I'll talk in a second, um, of energy, right? Um, you know, how much of this has been driven by ESG investing? And does it deal with how they characterize it as being sustainable? Um, just recently, because of this intermittency that Germany's facing and the high energy costs, the, they forced essentially the European Union to define nuclear and like hydrogen produced from nuclear as sustainable. Now, whether the ESG funds will follow suit or not, that was kind of like the realization that they can't run an economy on wind and solar alone. Now, let's talk about this. What are the opportunities from like an entrepreneurial point of view to deal with the long-term storage? Well, one is this idea of hydrogen, right? So you can, through electrolyzers, the wind and solar, excess energy, you can make hydrogen, store it, right? And then use it to power, it create electricity afterwards, or, you know, heat, right? Power to heat to power, right? So there are many great opportunities with this idea of what they call the green hydrogen. But there's also some problems with it, right? That this is something that entrepreneurs can figure out. One is that you do lose 25% of your energy when you do it. So you've got to have a really cheap energy source or generation to make it. It's also difficult to store and to transport because, you know, hydrogen's a small mo molecule. It actually leaks through steel and copper pipes, okay? In fact, they found that the only things that they could use to actually kind of store hydrogen are specialized ceramics and certain types of carbon fibers, okay? So um, this is an issue. Now, one idea is like, why don't we convert it to ammonia? Um, this is something that Saudi Arabia is explaining with, right? And that's, that's actually a, a pretty good idea. But again, there's an energy loss. So um, now I'm going to talk about this. This is, um, I interviewed an executive with one of these companies that's doing the green hydrogen. And they're making synthetic fuels. So after they make the green hydrogen, they then take carbon dioxide from a source, sometimes from the air. And they could build out the carbon chains to make, say, like gasoline and diesel fuel. That could run in just a normal internal combustion engine, but essentially it's carbon neutral. And they told me, right, um, one of the things, and this gets to the academic research, right, that's driving a lot of this hydrogen interest, well, because the technologies are difficult, um, that these entrepreneurial pitches is extremely important. So if you're looking for an area for academic researchers to do research on entrepreneurial pitches, <laughs> the green hydrogen is the place to be, right? Um, this is what he was telling me. And he said, like, the biggest issue for them right now, too, is there's just not enough electrolyzers. Now, the second one is this aspect of can't scaling. Can you get big enough? Because beyond the technology issue, they said that with any of this green hydrogen, if you're not big enough, you'll never be economically viable, even with sub government subsidies. So um, how can you scale? I guess it kind of gets back to uh, Sunday Kim's uh, research. But I mean, that's a nice entrepreneurship question is, is there a way that this green hydrogen can scale up quickly? Because right now, if they, they're, they're not able to do it. And that's affecting their profitability because the investors want to pay back. Okay. 
All right, here's another idea for that to, to deal with like, you know, the intermittency from renewables, another long-term storage. This is like old school technology, right? But it's working. Um, and this is pump storage. So the idea of this is like you have two reservoirs and when you have excess, you know, electrons, you pump up the water to, to the high uh, uh, elevation. And then when uh, you need the electricity, say at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., the sun goes down if you're using solar or the wind stops blowing, you just reverse it. And as the water goes through, it spins a turbine, it produces that electricity. Now, this is great, right? Because this can be seriously long-term, not like batteries, depending on how deep these reservoirs are. Um, some of the work that I've done in this, in the hydropower stuff, we find that you know, regulatory discretion matters quite a bit to get these projects approved. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of possibility here. Um, and actually, discretion matters too, because there's a lot of NIMBYs, not my backyard people, uh, who don't want these out there. Um, and so depending on the regulators, right, uh, you want to find a friendly place. Um, now, it's not just reservoirs. Here's a new company, a company called Rye Development. It's a startup, and they got a great idea because they went to Kentucky, and they said, we have all these old coal mines, and a lot of them are open pit, and then they actually have mine, underground mines too, caverns, and they connect to other open pits. And they said, wow, look at this. We could actually just use this infrastructure of an abandoned coal mine, have water high up on this open pit that's high up elevation, and use their mine shafts <laughs> as like where the conduit is for the water to fill up another open pit that they had, and thereby reuse you know, the infrastructure left by a coal mine. So they got approval, and they're going to be building this and in their process of you know, building this 400 megawatt long-term energy storage, pump storage plant. So these are great opportunities for entrepreneurs, um, I think. Uh, low tech, but easy to do, right? Because the technology is already there. Okay, let's turn to biofuels and biomass. Um, look at the demand here. They're expecting, you know, um, oh, by the way, just to give you, biofuels and biomass, these are oils that we get from growing crops or from animals, all right? They're expected to grow, okay? Um, so we look here, right? Um, they're also kind of expensive <laughs> compared to, say, like jet fuel from fossil fuels. This is a uh, uh, basically looking at the price of creating these biofuels from the crops that we grow. Now, one thing that I want to note on here is um, the assumption that they have that most of this will come from recycled grease, and I believe they will first because that is the cheapest, right? So this is actually a good thing in that we will, to, instead of going to the landfill, we could take, you know, waste vegetable oil from restaurants, right? And, uh, or, you know, animal lard from the um, rendering, instead of from the rendering, right, of animals, carcasses, and we'll be able to turn those into biofuels. But my guess is that we're actually going to see a growth with the um, crops, in fact, I didn't put it up here, but um, just today, because uh, I didn't get the slides updated, Eni, which is the Italian oil company out of Italy, has just made major announcement that they're going to invest in biofuels in Africa, right? By paying farmers to grow crops to make fuel, okay? What does this mean? Well, you probably heard of the term fuel farming. Right? So this is like something that the activists and environmentalists talk quite a bit about. But this is the idea of diverting food feedstocks to energy, to your fuel tank. Right? And the problem with this is, is that it naturally causes an increase in food prices. So this is what I'm worried about. And I think you know, entrepreneurs need to think about this too, is can we do biofuels biomass, but in such a way that we're not going to have a negative impact, or excuse me, a uh, inflationary impact on food prices. And I think there's a way to do that, but it's going to have to be carefully done so that we're not displacing food. Um, biogas. This is another great opportunity. Even here in Korea, this is a great opportunity, right? So this is methane produced from like landfills, sewage treatment facilities, farms. Everyone's got a sewage treatment facility, right? Um, there are farms here, I'm sure, uh, as well as landfills. And the idea is, is like, you know, with all these, they're always producing methane. Landfills are producing methane from the garbage. So you capture it, 
And then you take that methane, which is natural gas, you clean it, you can either put it in the pipes, the cell, or you can generate electricity. I've got a, I'm working on a project right now with uh, Joel Andrus at the University of Missouri, right in the heart of where all this, a lot of this has happened on the farmland. And what we're finding is like, what's driving a lot of this development in the United States, at least, is like infrastructure, um, meaning the pipes and the wires, capital, right? This is big for and this is a, a big factor for farmers and a lot of landfill owners who aren't the big mega companies. They don't have the capital to develop it, but also like their institutional logics or their beliefs, right? Um, some people just are like, yeah, why, why do I care? I don't care about this. But others, when they f carry these like environmental beliefs and values, they're more likely we're finding to jump in on this entrepreneurial endeavor. But uh, I think that this has got a lot of potential. Um, in this biogas. Another thing I want to talk about is marine energy. All right, this has been around for about two decades now. Actually, three decades. Two decades now of actually running, but three decades in terms of total development. Scotland is the world leader on this. Um, so just to give you an idea, these are turbines mounted to the seafloor, okay? <laughs> and, you know, water is 800 times more dense than air. So the amount of torque you get from one of these turbines is like 10 megawatts. It's a massive amount of energy just from one turbine. Um, they've got over 100 projects on these. Um, and uh, I'm on a project where right now we've got uh, looking at the global development of marine energy. And what we're finding is one of the bigger factors that's driving is these private-public partnerships, right? So they're working with governments. There's actually free technology. Some of these governments have developed, and then they license it out. Others, instead of doing the technology, they just give like grants. And we're in the process right now to see like, well, which is making the biggest difference of these different types of private-public partnerships. But this is going to grow, folks. Um, just this last year, Japan. Oh, well, there's look, uh, Mitsui OSK lines and Bambora Way, which is a new venture. So Bambora. Bombora Wave was founded. It's, got a, it's working with Mitsui OSK Lines, which I believe is a large Japanese company, incumbent company. They have purchased turbines from Scotland Power, and they've obtained already government undersea licenses to start installing these off the coast of Japan. All right? Hey, I mean, you're not that far away. And you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And by the way, the tides are stronger on the poles, so you've got a lot of potential here. This could be something here you know, for Korea to maybe look at. Right? Especially all your inland harbor inlets that you have, there's going to be a lot of tidal pull there to stick those on the bottom. Um, geothermal energy. All right, so now we're moving to dispatchable power. So this stuff you could have on and off all the time. Um, geothermal is great. Um, but it's very capital intensive. It's $20 million per well that you have to drill. And if you miss the resource, you got to drill another one. That's another 20. Let's say it takes you five times. You're up to 100 million. You still haven't produced, found the energy source. So that's the big risk with geothermal energy. Uh, working here with Sunshine Park on this, and we're finding that you know, one of the biggest things that's, that's affected geothermal, at least in the United States, has been this idea of like regulatory ambiguity that comes from how states define geothermal energy. Right? That puts it into conflict with other types of laws. So it's kind of a fun project. But um, I think that, you know, again, ring of fire, lots of opportunity here. The last thing I want to talk about before I end is, is nuclear. And yeah, fusion's possibility, right? They keep talking about fusion. But let's go back to the old school, uh, to fission, all right? Um, this is a, an entrepreneurial firm called New Scale, founded about two decades ago. And they've got their first small modular nuclear reactor approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's a 50 megawatt reactor. Folks, do you know how big this is? This fits in a container. Do you guys know the containers that go on ships, right? And you can put them on trucks. You sometimes see them, right, by the ports. That's how big these are. They're small. And the idea is with a 50 megawatt, right, you could actually transport it. It's like a little generator. <laughs> you could take it to some outing if you needed 50 megawatts and just plug it in and it runs. Zero emissions, zero sound. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So what they've got, they've got these other small modular nuclears under review. And you could see here in development is like what they plan. They've already got, by the way, a, um, a project in southern Idaho that's going to come online. They've already got purchasing power agreements with Rocky Mountain Power to buy that. But their idea is, hey, we could build up, 
you know, up to one gigawatt electricity, it could be made in like 12 module, modules or six modules or even four, like at the, maybe the 231 type size, right? And the great thing is, if you think about the risk of meltdowns and the negative impact nuclear, it's, it's a one over, it's an inverse log or a, a exponential function, right? So like the risks increasingly go down as you get smaller. When you're at 50 megawatts, the risk of a meltdown is like 0.000000, right? And even if some sort of bad thing were to happen, it's just too small to make a large impact, okay? So this is why having them in module design is actually a brilliant idea, I feel, moving forward. But here's the problem, academically and for an entrepreneur, tremendous opposition to nuclear still. They're stigmatized, right? So what will companies be able to do to overcome it? How can they frame it differently? What's their pitch, right? Both for an entrepreneur and an academic, we can think about that. Um, we can think also about the financing coming from a finance party. Will ESG funds get involved in this? Will they buy into it? I mean, I hope so because I think this is a great energy source. Um, it's dispatchable. It's on all the time, right? Um, okay. Oh, sorry. I got one more. Recycling. This is a big issue. So 90% of internal combustion cars are currently reused or recycled around the world. 0% of EVs right now are. All right, this is a big issue, waste issue. We already talked about how much minerals may, needed to make an EV. What are we gonna do about the recycling of these? We're not doing it yet. Huge entrepreneurial opportunity. Now, the pro, if we look at the, the evolution of the recycling industry that Mike Lounsbury you know, did and his colleagues, Right? We found that it was largely driven by the environmental movement and it wasn't profitable. In fact, even today in the United States, the recycling industry is not profitable. They're basically, it's done by these um, you know, waste management companies. They make their money off of garbage and they subsidize the garbage pickup with the recycling programs that are mandated by the country and the state or municipality. So given that, the question is, is this, can this be economically feasible? Which actors are going to take the lead? Will China dominate this like it has everything else? Or will like South Korea get it on this? Right? This could be a great opportunity. You just figure out the technologies and figure out a way it could be economically sustainable. Oh, one more, last one. Sorry, carbon offset markets. Okay, all right. So EU has been trading carbon for a long time, right? And I've got some couple papers looking at the consequences and how firms react to this in these carbon markets. But what makes us really unique here in the United States is that there is no mandated market, and yet companies are jumping aboard because they want you know, to show that they're being environmental responsible. All right, so take a look at this. We, so the, those that are, emit the lowest amount of emissions are like aerospace and high tech. Look who's purchasing the biggest purchaser so far, <laughs> Microsoft, high tech. It hardly emits anything, but they're going to purchase a lot of like, you know, these carbon offsets, right? And carbon dioxide removal, maybe because it's also they got high margins, right? And so you go down to energy being the highest. But let's move a little bit further. Many companies are shying away from carbon credits. A complex web of standards, varying definitions of carbon credit quality and lack of market transparency keep them from buying it, all right? It's like the wild, wild west in the US. So here's some interesting questions, and I think for an entrepreneur as well as an academic, how do firms respond to these voluntary markets run by NGOs? Are there, I mean, are these, these carbon offsets, are they really like um, sustainable solutions or as I, are they, as I call them, corporate indulgences, right? To appease politicos and like the ESG investors. What is the quality offsets? Look at this. The Guardian a newspaper in the UK four months ago found Vera being one of the largest carbon offset companies, 90% of their offsets, offsets were fraudulent. 90%. And of course, they followed up since, and all the companies that had bought it, you know, oh, they're not returning. I know they're like, it's still on the reports as being like offset, right? So there's a big quality issue, right? So, I mean, one of the questions is, how can certifiers maybe influence these firm decisions? There's, this is a a big thing coming out for entrepreneurs as well is external auditors coming in, certifiers, to say that these carbon offsets are legitimate, right? Maybe if they had more of these, firms might adopt more because they'll say, uh, these are actually real. 
But this is sort of like this very ambiguous market right now um, in the United States. So anyway, um, wrap that up. So hopefully you can see like, you know, lots of pract practical entrepreneurial and uh, academic possibilities in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, <clears throat> insights. I am going to now turn the mic to Professor Kim. Uh, he's going to be discussing uh, Professor Hyatt's work. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, go through the materials and and get, get a lot of information about the different sources of renewable energy and different kinds of challenges. Actually, uh, last night I stayed in a hotel uh, in Dongdaemun. And when you go into the room, you know, oftentimes they have commercial about hotel. But the commercial actually uh, so send a message about their sustainability and how it is important and how serious it is. <laughs> Uh, they are doing dealing with the sustainability. So I guess even in hotel business, uh, there are a lot of these issues can apply. So uh, maybe this is an exciting uh, topic, I guess. Okay, so uh, in the presentation, uh, the Professor Sean Hia's presentation, so I get a lot of information. There are diverse sources and issues, uh, you know, different sources of renewable energy and the hydrogen uh, as an important uh, storage device and also all kinds of different other uh, sources. And Depending on these diverse sources, we have diverse challenges. So I did uh, actually, I sort of maybe understand, but I didn't pay attention to the mineral and matter problem, maybe. Not only in uh, the battery, but also wind and solar, I didn't actually recognize that. And also geopolitics, the distribution of production and mining. And there are certain issues of reliability, especially in wind and solar and hydrogen problems and recycling of EV. So I, I guess we have a lot of different challenges and, uh, and different sources. And depending on each sources, we have uh, different kinds of challenges. That's what I understood. <laughs> so uh, I took uh, Doug Magadam's uh, social movement class <laughs> in my graduate study. And in social movement, uh, they often talk about three pillars. The first one is political opportunity, how social movements capture the opportunities. Sometimes in dealing with the government or legislation or, or oftentimes some court decisions or some local politics and resource mobilizing and also the cultural framing. So all these issues are in the uh, renewable energy areas, I guess. <laughs> So in political aspects, there is uh, geopolitical issues uh, in energy security and war we, have, we are having right now. And also some, it has to deal with some social contentions and regulations. And also the mobilizing uh, is very important because it seems to involve some ecosystem uh, establishment and that requires some dealing with the supply chains and value networks and also stakeholder engagement. So that's the important part of mobilizing. And also uh, some of the, uh, these energy sources like uh, uh, fuel farming is uh, very strange to me, but that's kind, kind of new category is emerging. So how new category is emerging and legitimated and how it is framed, that's also an important issue in the entrepreneurship. So um, I looked around in my town and I saw kind of uh, two cases uh, related to renewable energy. The f 
So my, my town I live is in the coastal area. It's called Ulsan. And there was a kind of a very ambitious attempt to build the off, offshore wind farm. Oftentimes we have windmill near the coastal area, but this one is on the ocean. And that's kind of requires big const construction. And I heard that uh, it's, it was done by some European countries in Northern Europe or Spain. So uh, previous uh, city governor initiated this project as a part of efforts to revitalize the city, the local city. And uh, in, in the town, the large shipbuilding companies there called uh, heavy, uh, Hyundai Heavy Industry. And their shipbuilding business has been in trouble for the last 10 years. Right now it's recovering. So they saw this as a new opportunity because it requires some ocean engineering and big system development. And also there are contractors and suppliers, uh, small and medium sized companies are supplying shipbuilding business and they are also interested in. So they saw the upper business opportunity in this kind of efforts. And, uh, since uh, this business has been developed in, uh, in northern European countries, there has been global investors and global energy companies. For example, Total, French company, were investing in this project. And uh, I think these, um, these are like a very big, large financing project, so they require some intermediaries. So I saw these kind of things happening in the last five years, even though it's a still early stage. Then I was talking about the previous governor and the previous presidents, and these new initiatives are based on their sort of progressive energy policy, and they called Korean New Deal. And in that process, there was social contention unexpectedly from the, uh, the fishery industries, because they think it they, they will affect the fishing industry. So there was kind of year-long protest. So they have to deal with that. But when they kind of you know, successfully deal with that, there was change of the government. Now we have more con conservative, the Yun administration, and they, I mean, they are conservative in, in terms of energy policy too. So now they are, they are paying attention to the nuclear power, which is also in that area. And they are talking about the SMR as a future development. And also there is social contention against continuing and maintaining the nuclear the power business. So these are the kind of scene uh, we, can, I can, we can typically observe and expect when, there is, there, when the players try to transition from one source of energy to another, I guess. And there was a small example in my uh, the school campus. There was a group of scientists are working on the toilet system. It's a small toilet system. But this is special in the sense that they don't use water. And they use the human feces converting into a biogas. And they use the energy for their the, uh, the housing, heating, house heating, and so on. So this group of scientists actually builds so-called like a living lab. So they build a small house and they uh, uh, they, they show, they kind of show that, you know, this system is working. And their project is called Science Warden. You know, they got this name from uh, Henry Thoreau, right? So this is like, like a, this is early, early stage, very small ideas, but this kind of opportunities are there too. So uh, with all this diverse kind of issues, I would just uh, uh, think about like four uh, broad ideas, maybe uh, entrepreneur, uh, maybe uh, important in entrepreneurship, and also the research in entrepreneurship. The first one I thought about is technology, because depending on like uh, different challenges, there can be some engineering solutions, maybe hydrogen issues or some carbon issues. There can be some technical uh, solutions, and I know. Uh, many university researchers are working in these early stage technologies, uh, especially in the energy areas. And when I look at the, uh, the Korean cases, there, there has been government support, government funding. So like in other emerging technology sectors, this government su support can lead to like a formation of more private initiatives and move to the market-based entrepreneurship. 
I think is interesting to watch. And that requires, of course, more commercialization, not only the you know, technology prototypes, but commercialization and corresponding business model. So how this process of successfully you know, moving into the market and business can, can happen from the technology developments may be an interesting topic and opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs, I guess. The second one is the energy sector has you know, giant players, big energy companies, oil and gas companies, and power companies and utility companies. So for them, I guess they have to deal with this sort of transition management because uh, you know, their business is uncertain and there is uncertain the political and social space. So they have to deal with that. So I think that's, that's another important uh, topic. And I thought about sort of loose coupling strategy, sort of, you know, somehow they have to maintain their conventional energy business, but also they have to try some new things. So how to maintain these tensions? I think that's an interesting uh, thing. And of course, that involves stakeholder management. Uh, the government policies sometimes change, and depending on the change of the government, they have to deal with that. And also, there, there has been some social contentions, so they have to deal with that. And especially uh, in Korea, maybe also in other countries, uh, the energy sector, uh, you know, energy is sort of uh, considered as public good, so there is state-sponsored or state-owned companies. So comparing state-owned companies and private companies, th these are quite large, giant companies, how they are dealing this transition management differently. Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting topic, uh, might be interesting. And the entrepreneurs and startups, I guess there are certain niches are emerging uh, in this overall, the broad transitions, but to uh, develop business in this niche, they require more institutional work by nature, and they have to deal with like a more public-private relationship and also some collective action issues. I think it's it's been done by the professor Sean Hia's research a lot, so I guess these are uh, getting more important, and also maybe more specifically. Because of the nature of this business, entrepreneurs' backgrounds and career might be uh, different. So normally we would expect entrepreneurs from you know, the, uh, some other incumbent companies or some commercial background, but in this business it can be more diverse and it can be more outsiders, I guess. So type, in, the, in that sense, what kind of typology of entrepreneurs we can expect in this uh, in this space of uh, energy, new, renewable energy entrepreneurship will be interesting. And lastly, I thought about comparative perspective. Even though we talk about the, the, the structure and agency, but the, some conditions for entrepreneurial activities are quite important for them to happen and for them to grow. So, there can be, we can maybe think about some institutional conditions, some variance, uh, variation in institutional conditions. For example, I thought about there are regional or country level variation in government initiatives and climate politics. So it seems that EU are more proactive in making the like regulated environments for this green business. So that's EU Green Deal and they even make the taxonomies so that you know, they can clearly classify which one belongs to renewable or not. And Korea followed that example, uh, of course, the previous government. I'm not sure about the current government. So when government play this kind of role and where, like uh, this kind of institutional condition, how they will affect the entrepreneurial activities and outcome will be an interesting topic. And also, this, these are not stable, these are over time changes. So maybe even in the US, uh, there was Trump administration and Biden administration. I, I'm sure there's a sort of big difference in, uh, to the energy sector and the entrepreneurs in energy sector. And we don't know which one will come next. So <laughs> it will be very interesting experiment to see how 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the institutional or government factors play out in the entrepreneurial process. So overall, in conclusion, I think sustainability and renewable energy is a fertile ground for entrepreneurship in the sense that there is a diversity of entrepreneurship because the nature of this area involves not only the business, but technology, society, and institution. I believe um, the, the one who understands uh, these aspects of entrepreneurship is uh, the professor Sean Hiat, and he has done a series of research, developing series of research agenda along this line. So uh, I think it's very exciting. And with uh, this background, I think uh, if we study approach uh, entrepreneurship in this way, it will bro uh, broaden the horizon of entrepreneurship, not only focusing on the market-based entrepreneurship, but more connected to the uh, societal or governmental sectors. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Professor Hyatt, would you like to respond to uh, Professor Kim's comments, please? Oh, yeah. No, I, I thought great comments there. Um, oh, for him? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, at least I'll, I'll, I'll address that last aspect, especially in the United States, right? So uh, there was this massive bill um, that was passed to try to uh, push forward a lot of this uh, low-carbon energy term the Inflation Reduction Act that had nothing to do with inflation, but that's how they, uh, they called it, right? It was essentially sort of like a mini what they call the Green New Deal in a way. Um, the, per, it, per, um, it's essentially a trillion and a half dollars over 10 years for hydrogen, carbon capture, lots of wind and solar subsidies. Um, but then they sunset at 10 years, right? So one of the questions, of course, like you said, is the it's this aspect of like the political uncertainty is for many of the companies, uh, like I mentioned that HIF, right? They have to scale because it's not only getting the scale to be economically feasible, but depending on who's in power, those subsidies may not continue because there already is a sunset date. And once those are gone, right, then what happens to the company? So this is like a, a large uncertainty, which is kind of typical of how politics work in the United States when it comes to uh, government tax policy. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and I've been missing, mispronouncing his last name. So he's Professor Hyatt, not Hyatt. <laughs> um, so my sincere apologies. And thanks again uh, for sharing not only academic, but also uh, business insights. Um, and thank you, Professor Kim, for uh, discussing uh, um, his, Professor Hyatt's great work. Um, I'd love to take questions from the floor, but in the interest of time, uh, we, need a, we need a break before we start the, the next session. So I think we are going to uh, just close the uh, session here and then um, have a coffee break. So I'm going to- But come up to me in, during the break if you have That'd questions. That would be excellent. Yes. <laughs> Right, thanks so much. I think it's a great time to uh, follow uh, Professor Sun Yun Park uh, by you know, relaxing ourselves and stretching, right? So uh, let's take uh, about 20 minute uh, short uh, coffee break. Uh, just go outside and you can find a, uh, a cup of coffee. And then uh, we can continue with your next session uh, at 3 p.m. Thank you. Oh, 4, 4 p.m., sorry. <laughs>